Hello. Welcome to the Yale Center for British Arts online series, At Home, Artists in Conversation. I'm Courtney J. Martin, the Paul Mellon Director of the Yale Center for British Art. I am delighted to welcome Injadeka Akunili Crosby to our program today. Before we begin, please note that this program will be recorded. Your camera and sound are muted and will remain so throughout. We will be using the Q&A feature located on your navigation bar to gather your questions for Injadeka. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time as they will be answered at the end of the conversation. Yale University acknowledges that indigenous people and nations, including Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Shigantacoke, Golden Hill, Pagusset, Niantic, the Quinnipiac, and other Algonquin speaking people have stewarded the generations, the land and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these people, these nations, and this land. Njedeka Akunyele Crosby was born in Nigeria in 1983. She currently lives and works in Los Angeles. She received a BA from Swarthmore College in 2004, a post bac certificate from the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in 2006, and an MFA from Yale School of Art in 2011. Drawing on art historical, political, and personal references, she creates densely layered figurative compositions that illustrate the complexity of contemporary experience. While her formative years in Nigeria are a constant source of inspiration, her grounding in our history adds further layers of reference. Religious art, Edouard Vuillard's domestic interior patterns, the academic tradition of portraiture, and still life painting are influences that also inform her practice. Her cultural identity is a combination of her strong attachment to Nigeria, her birth home, and to her adopted home in the States, an identity that is reflected in much of her artwork. She was a participant in the Venice Biennale in 2019, and recent solo exhibitions include those at the National Portrait Gallery in London in 2018, the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth in 2018, and the Baltimore Museum of Art in 2017. She is the 2020 recipient of an honorary doctorate of fine arts from the University of the Arts in Philadelphia, an honorary doctorate from her alma mater, Swarthmore College in 2019, and a MacArthur Fellowship Genius Award winner in 2017. Awarded the United States Artist Fellowship this year, Indradeka's paintings are in museum collections throughout the world. In 2022, she'll be featured in a solo exhibition at the Yale Center for British Art as part of a series curated by the Pulitzer Prize winning author Hilton Alls. This exhibition will be the first time that a School of Art alum receives a solo show at the center. We could not be more excited. I have to tell you, Injadeka, this is such a big and positive thing for us to look forward to. We are so excited to be working with you and to be showing your work. In fact, the series that we'll be showing entitled The Beautiful Ones is what we're really going to talk about today. Should we run through a few of these images just to get our audience on board with what you've been doing and what the work is like? Yes, and to familiarize them with this particular series. I was like, thank you for the beautiful introduction. <laughs> I should stop. Oh, thank you. This is a first in this series, but the series actually dates from 2013, is that correct? That the first painting you actually completed was in 13? The very first beautiful ones I did, which is not part of the series per se, was when I was at the Studio Museum, so I think 2012. Yes. It was much larger, but the first beautiful ones that counts as part of the series, you're right, was 2013. Can you tell me a bit about the inspiration for this series? What does the beautiful ones refer to? Why compile these paintings as a group in this manner? Sure. So before I answer that question, I just wanted to thank everybody who is tuning in. It's a pleasure to have you part of this talk. Grateful to you. I want to thank the Yale Center for British Art for inviting me to be a part of this series. And of course, Courtney, to say thank you, not just for the introduction, but for doing this conversation with me. I've been looking forward to it for weeks now. 
and also to thank all the people behind the scene, Jane and Linda and the technical crew and people that I didn't get a chance to meet who helped make this possible and run smoothly. So the beautiful ones, when I started it, I didn't think it was going to be a series. I had just started with, if you go back to number one, please, this painting of my sister, there was a bigger version. And with the beautiful ones, I noticed that up until this point, I had stayed away from straight up portraiture. If you look at a lot of my works coming before this, I always did this thing where the character turned away from the viewer or you were looking at things from the head. And I think that was because when I was in grad school, I kept getting the biggest critique I got for my work was it just didn't seem now, it didn't seem contemporary things. People always felt things looked old. This looked like it was done in the 60s, in the 50s, in the 70s, whatever decade they gave me, the fact was that it looked like it was old. And so for my second year, I spent so much time trying to shake that, this off, like how can I make work that exists in my time and in the present? And I just noticed that sometimes making moves like, I think maybe I was over rendering the work too much. It just kind of rendered it till it boxed itself in. So I kept trying to find ways to break out of that. And I noticed that I just get really precious when I do faces. And so uh, it was almost like a, every artist has a little bag of tricks. So one of the things I started doing was I just had to find ways to make compositions that did not include the face. So I finished grad school. I was at the Studio Museum. At this point, it had been about two, three years of always avoiding faces. And I like setting challenges for myself. So I just set a challenge for myself that I wanted to do a straight up portrait. Like, this can be called nothing but a portrait painting, um, just to challenge myself and just to also know that I could do it. I couldn't run away from this forever. And so once I made the decision, I thought, okay, if I'm going to do this, I need inspiration. And I pulled down my Velasquez book and I started looking at it. And I was thinking of looking at him because, you know, his paintings are hundreds of years old, but trying to figure out how some of them still excite me and still felt very dynamic and exciting. So I landed on this painting of Prince Balthasar Carlos. And it's this little kid with very rich fabric and he's wearing this like billowy pantaloons, like his trousers as his billowy trousers. And just something about that reminded me of pictures from our childhood. You know, we didn't have the tradition of disposable cameras or like our parents didn't have cameras. So photographs for us only existed for special occasions. It was like a festival or a birthday party or a graduation. So all the pictures in my family from when we were kids were all these very like formal, posed, highly stylized pictures. And the Velasquez work really reminded me of that. So I, it just made me think I want to do a painting of my sister in this tombo outfit she had with the billowy pants and take inspiration from Velasquez and think of ways to take this image and flatten it into big, simple shapes. So thinking of her head, her arms, and her legs as blocks of dark shapes against her white outfit in front of this light blue wall, and her outfit and the wall flattening into another block of a light shape. And so really planning the work in a very like abstract, flat way could be how I could break out of this being too precious with the face. So that's how I started this work. And I made it, and I love this painting so much that I made three versions. This is why this is 1C. The first one I made, I sold it, and I regretted it so much that I made another one, which I kept for myself. And an artist I really admire asked me for a trade. So I made a third one to trade with the artist. And I enjoyed it so much, I wanted to revisit it again. So then I did number two, which ended up being my older brother when he was young and of course I enjoyed it so much I ended up doing number three and by number three I realized this was going to be you know decades long maybe lifelong series I'm on number nine right now and I'm just about in my studio to start number 10. I have the paper stretched out and I'm still trying to work out the composition.
As you're working on this series, are you working on other painting series or individual paintings simultaneously, or are you solely focused on this series? Yeah, I'm working on different things. So the way I work is each, within my body of work, there are little like series clusters. The beautiful ones is one of them. And depending on what the work is, it takes a lot, a different kind of like mental energy and time. So like the very large group works with multiple figures tends to take a lot of planning to really nail down the composition and how things move and every choice I make in the work. And the beautiful ones take a lot of time because it's one of those things that it seems simple, but because it's simple and small, everything needs to hit just right. But it takes a different kind of planning from like the bigger triptychs. So usually I intersperse the work. So after doing, say, a triptych with a middle panel that is a group of people together, I might decide to do a beautiful ones for a change of pace. So for instance, I just finished this very complicated piece behind me that took over a year. And I just feel like I need to reset my head and I need to do something with a different pace. So I'm going to do the beautiful ones. That's why I end up doing about one a year. I'm doing other things at the same time, but the beautiful ones have almost become my reset wow. because so many of them are family members. It's a series that is very dear to me and just calms and recenters me. Am I correct that number five that we're looking at right now, that this is your mother as a child or yes, taken this is, your mother as a child? It is. And it's actually, <laughs> oh, where is this? It's like the picture I have on my screensaver behind it all. So it's a picture of my mother as a child. We don't have a lot of pictures of her from that time. I mean, if you're thinking of how my siblings and I barely had any pictures from when we were young, my parents had even fewer because photography was such a big deal. So from that age, I think we have only two pictures of her. And this is from a bigger picture of her whole family together. So that's where this came from. So yes, it's my mother as a child. Wow. When you say that you, you sort of use it as your reset, I'm fascinated by this as an idea because as you're working on something larger, like the work that is hanging behind you, are you drawing? Are you sketching out ideas about ones about that series? Do you make preparatory drawings in any way in preparation for the thing that you will return to at a certain point? Yeah. So the beautiful ones has been going on for long enough now that it's that I'm constantly thinking of ideas for it. Even when I'm working on something else at the back of my mind, it's always going. So for instance, this one was done in 2018, but I've known from as early as maybe 2015, maybe 14, 15, that I wanted to do a painting of a, uh, someone in school uniform, a schoolgirl. Because when I think back of growing up, you know, just so much of your childhood is spent in school and we wear uniforms in Nigeria. My uniform from my primary school is actually very similar to what this child has on. And so that was one I always knew I wanted, but I didn't have the right reference picture. And every time I went back to Nigeria, I was always looking for school children to photograph, but it took a number of years because I tended to go back at Christmas time and school was not in session. So I have a folder of like future beautiful ones ideas and I'm constantly thinking about it. So the number 10 I'm about to start is from a picture I have considered painting like from very early on in the series. It's an image based off of when I did my first Holy Communion, but right. I never wanted to do it because I felt like my outfit was embarrassingly gaudy. And I had also done a painting of my sister at her, if the one with the white dress, I think it's number four. Right. I had done a painting of my sister during her first Holy Communion. And I thought it would be too much to have like two religious white dress outfits, but it's one of the things I've I keep going back to every year and I just thought I should finally do it. And something that happened about three, four years ago is that because I have a lot of, of us as kids in my family, I reached out to my high school because we have a WhatsApp thread. So I reached out to them and I explained the whole project to them and I told them 
that I would love to expand it beyond the family. And if anybody wanted to share pictures with me, I would appreciate it. And my younger sister also did the same with her friends. So I have all these pictures that have come in. And my little brother also got a lot of pictures from his good friend who is now his wife. <laughs> so I have like all these people who've given me their family pictures. So the other idea I've been thinking of actually comes from my now sister-in-law's family. Um, there are a couple pictures there that have been. Actually, if you go to number nine. Wow. Yeah, so it's hard to see, but the picture, not the picture right next to the TV, but the one with the gray frame. Yes. Two away from the TV is from my now sister-in-law's family album and that's from her like primary school graduation. So I have all these beautiful one ideas I keep, I'm always thinking about them. Like, how do I work on this? Because I take parts of the pictures and I change it up a lot. So what do I do to it? Where do I set it? Why is this worthwhile for me? Why this picture and not that? What do I want to say with this? What do I hope to achieve with this? And until I can answer those questions, I just kind of keep it at bay. And once I feel like I'm getting an idea of why I need to do this work, then I begin. Can you talk a little bit about process? Because I think, you know, for those of us who are coming to these paintings, I mean, they are incredibly rich and dense and multi-layered. And, you know, you read the description, acrylic paint, colored pencil, transfers and collage on paper. But can you talk us through what that actually is as a process that we then see? How do you start? Oh, this is the question that is hardest for me to answer on Zoom. I feel like I do a really good job of answering it in my studio because I can actually pull up boxes and I have a folder on each work and you can see the stages because I do a lot of taking pictures of a work in progress and I draw on it, I sketch on it, and you can actually see the stage by stage of how the work grew. It's harder to do it like this. I will try my best. I'm actually, I'll say, could you please go to number three? Yes. I think I have something that might help. I won't have pictures of the work in progress, but I can maybe do a brief walkthrough of how a piece came about. So I'm, I'm gonna hold this up. It's hard to see, but this is a picture. Can you see? Yes. That's a picture I took in Nigeria. I don't know when, like 2013, 2012. And there's this person right there yes. in the yellow shirt with the little puff puff hairstyle. It's called Ukuose. So my mother had taken me to a wedding somewhere. You just end up following your parents to a lot of events. You don't even know where you're going. So we ended up at this wedding. There was all this stuff going on. I wasn't really interested. I didn't know who the people were. So I had my camera on me. I take my camera with me and I take lots of pictures when I'm in Nigeria. So I left the reception. I got tired and I was walking out and I walked up by the gate of the building and there were all these people just gathered outside looking in on the reception. You know, just something was so familiar about that whole scene. And I noticed this one girl, actually there were ended up being two, but I noticed this one girl in the yellow shirt. This was around Christmas time. I ended up going around Christmas. And in Nigeria, Christmas is big there, but it's Christmas culture is very different from here. We don't do Santa. We don't do presents and all Christmas tree and all that stuff. But one big thing we do is you always get new clothes for Christmas. So around Christmas, all the kids are out and everybody's dressed up. You have like probably like your one new outfit for the year and you're feeling yourself. So it's just like, it just resonated with me, like seeing these little kids in their outfits. Like I remember getting my Christmas clothes, especially the girl with the little jacket. You could tell she was over the moon, but I was more interested in the girl in yellow because I used to have that hairstyle when I was really young. It's called ukose. It's like the first thing you do to your hair before it gets long enough for full on threading. So I asked her if I could take her picture and she said yes, but the whole time she was a little bit shy. And of course I wanted to be respectful and I didn't push. And then the other girl kind of came, I was like, you can take my picture. <laughs> and she's posing and we just, and we ended up having a blast. And I mean, you can see her here doing like her full pose. Yeah. So I took all the pictures and I came back and I kind of had a feeling I was going to do something 
with them from the beautiful ones. So this is the first that was not a family member, but they just reminded me so much of my siblings and I, I felt it could pass. I ended up taking the girl with the arms akimbo from one picture and the girl with the arms bent from another picture and I put them together. And the girl in the yellow for her skirt, she's wearing this blisco pattern that is called the jumping horse that is very popular in Eastern Nigeria. It's almost like a mark of Igbo identity. This is the blisco book that is about their iconic heritage patterns. And it said in Nigeria, it's traditionally worn by Igbo women and I'm Igbo. So it was good to see it and learn, know like, okay, I wasn't imagining this. This is like tied to like an Igbo identity in some way. So I have her wearing the jumping horse skirt because I wanted it to be a throwback to a different time, like when I was younger. And so then I start populating the piece from things that are made up and things from other places. So the plant behind her is actually a picture of a plant I have in my house, an Indian rubber plant. And the wall in front of her is based off of this like ledge we had by a gate in the house where I grew up in. And the terrazzo floor is from a house in the village, but it's also an architectural thing that was very popular in, in houses that were built in the 80s. So I was trying to pull this back to a slightly different time, even though the pictures were now. So I finished this work. And I liked, I was very happy with it, but you know, when you just still have that feeling of, I don't think I did all I could with the girl with the little ukuose hair. I mean, I, I just, I can't explain it. Like she spoke to my soul. I just felt like I wanted to revisit it again, take another go at it and see what I could do. So if you could please go to number seven, you'll see how that image was reworked into something else. Just in terms of like trying to explain how I build work. It wouldn't be perfect, but I will try. So this is it. So I kind of isolated her image from that picture again. And um, I'm laughing like, should I confess this? Yes. I'm not very good at, what's it called? Imaginative drawing. It surprises people. I got, I had someone reach out to me and they said they wanted to do like, they wanted to print out pages from my sketchbook. And my immediate answer was like, no! <laughs> because my sketchbook is stick figures. People don't believe it till I show it to them. Stick figures, that's how, or you know, just like stick gesture figures, including yeah. like the picture I have for this work in the back is like a stick figure with plants in front of her, but it totally made sense in my mind. I need to look at something, I need a reference. And so in the picture I had of her, her legs were not there. And so I had to think of a way to make that work that she didn't have her legs. Because there was like, um, let me see if I can find, there was a little kid in front of her, you can see it. Yes. So I was trying to figure out how to make it work, but I love challenges like that because they kind of make you come up with other things. In the first iteration, I had put a wall in front of her, but that just, it didn't feel like, you know, sometimes you arrive at a solution and you feel this was the best solution. I felt like maybe I could try again. So I went back to her picture. I really loved the richness of her skin tone against that yellow outfit. And I felt like I wanted to play up that color, the like dark mahogany against this yellow up a bit more. So I was thinking I wanted it to feel more like a field of yellow. And then once I made that decision, I could start thinking like, okay, what yellow things do I bring in? And this is where I'm looking at lots of resources. I'm looking at lots of pictures from Nigeria. I'm making notes, I'm writing. So I, I will have like a list going, like what could be in front of her? What are the things you would have laying around in my experience of Nigeria? Like, could it be a bucket? Could it be a jerry can? Could it be this? And then of course I'll go online. I'll look for pictures. I'll try them out in front of her. And finally, once I decided I wanted this field of yellow, I was thinking of in Lagos or in certain parts of Nigeria, you end up with this very yellow pictures because of all the buses and taxis. So I thought of it and thought, okay, that's what I want to do. And I started looking through my own pictures to see if I had any bus pictures and I found this one. Wow. Yeah, so I 
map that out and put it in the background. And then once I had those, it became easy for me to figure out like, oh yeah, she's standing in front of a car. And then once I decided she's standing in front of the car, then I have to take time and do research and figure out what car she's standing in front of. What are the car brands that would have been very popular at this time? And of course the Peugeot 504 was like, no brainer, very easy. <laughs> And the Lagos taxis and even Enugu taxis where I grew up are this very iconic yellow with the dark black, two black bands on it. And so it's just one of those things like it took a long time of thinking, but then once I made this one decision, everything just there falling into place. And the piece resolved itself. Then of course I had to go online and look at hundreds of images of 504s and figure out which one had the right orientation I wanted because like, do you want to draw the back? Do you want to draw the front? Do you want it this way? Do you want it that way? And I can't really imagine it well. So I had to, and this is where having people who helped me out is fantastic because I could just, just like do a Google image search for Peugeot 504 and find every car in this orientation or that orientation or this orientation. And they put it all in a folder and then I whittle it down and whittle it down. And then I found this one and it was easy to change up the color because I found like a model of a toy Lagos taxi online that I could use to swap it out. And so I figured it all out and that's how this work existed. And I think I ended up changing the license plate because the, the Peugeot car I found was in Germany, but I wanted it to have Nigerian plates. So then I had to find like a Nigerian car and switch. So it's like little things like that. So it's like a piecemeal coming together. And Chideke, do you think you're finished with this little girl? Do you think that you'll return to her? Right now, I feel satisfied. So I know when I'm going to go back to a work. A few works I have that I've gone back to, and it's usually when you have this, there's just this feeling you can't explain, but it's just like, I don't feel I've reached the end of this road. And then the piece across from me is a screen wall. And I'm actually doing this because there's this piece I did years ago that I liked, but I didn't quite feel I reached the end of the road. But now looking at the new version, I feel like, yeah, I've reached it. <laughs> and so I feel it with the girl in yellow. I love this piece. I think I've reached the end of that road. The, her friend in the jacket, I keep thinking maybe someday I'll go back to her. <laughs> I just feel like it needs to be more over the top. She was such a character because Nigerian kids are very shy and she just wanted to be photographed. I do think about them. I keep thinking, I wish I could track them down. I don't even know if they know they're in these works. But once again, you know, we just realized I don't even know where I was. I don't know what village. I got dressed. I sat in a car. We drove. We ended up at the wedding. So I, I am sad that I, I don't have any way to track them back down. Can you talk to us a little bit about where the title for the series comes from? I have read the book from which the title is taken by Ayikwe Ama. I am fascinated by your use of that title and the reference to that novel. Can you just talk to us a little bit about that? Um, so the title complete with the spelling of why with beauty. I love that there are layers to it. I'll get to it. Um, but the title comes from a book. I feel like I'm now just like, I think I remember this story, but he had titled it that way because in Nigeria, on our buses and lorries, people write things on them. And they're usually like, you know, life is, life will be better tomorrow. They're usually uplifting things. And from what I remember, he had seen a lorry that had a text on it that had beautiful with the Y on it. And he liked that spelling, it's almost like full of beauty. And so his book was titled, The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born. And this book was written in the sixties and just thinking of like history of West Africa in the sixties. So Nigeria used to be a former British colony as was Ghana. Ivory Coast used to be a former French colony as was Benin Republic, but there are all these countries along the Western coast of Africa that were owned by, or like other European countries claimed they owned. So like from the late fifties to the late sixties, there was this wave of independence that just went, not just across the West Africa, but all through the whole continent. With Nigeria became independent in 1960. It became independent from British rule. So after um, all these countries became independent, and I think with Nigeria, not only did we become independent, there was also like oil being discovered. 
And I think it was such a hopeful period across the continent where people felt like, you know, that just that feeling of we're finally going to come into our own. We've not been given the space to do this and things are going to be better. Things will be managed better. Like we're going to prioritize ourselves. These countries will be fantastic. I mean, for a long time, people talked about Nigeria being like the giants of Africa. But then after all these independence, there was a lot of like military dictatorships, coup, you know, just like countries still dealing with the effects of formerly being colonized. It's never a clean break. So it just things did not progress. If anything, things went downhill. Like in Nigeria, we just had like military coup after military coup after military coup. My whole time I was in Nigeria, we had military dictators. And so this book is really set in the middle of this loss of hope. So it's a lot about like corruption in government and how things are, don't move as much as they should because of the people in charge. And so it's a book that comes from a place of lost hope. Like the beautiful ones are not yet born. Like the promise did not arrive. And one of the reasons why I decided to become an artist was that after my time at Swarthmore, I kind of was at this crossroad where I could go to med school, or I could do art. And I went back to Nigeria. This was 2004, 2005. I went back to Nigeria and I spent a year and I was so aware of this cultural renaissance that was happening in a way that I hadn't seen or experienced when I left Nigeria five years before. Like Nigerian music was blowing up, Nigerian fashion, Nigerian literature, Nigerian movies became the pace setter for movie making across the continent. So I really felt like there was this change, there was this thing in the air, this feeling of like we're finally coming into our own. I felt it that year. I kept thinking of that cultural renaissance that was happening and how I wanted to be a part of it. So that's a huge part of my decision to go into arts. And so with this series, I was thinking of my generation and just how so many of us are doing what Achebe had encouraged, spoken about for years, which is that Africans had to stand up and tell their own stories and not let someone else tell your own story for you. I think he has the phrase that until the lion learns to speak, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter and just talking of how we had to take charge of our own narratives. And I could feel that happening in all these different creative fields. And so the title is kind of thinking of my parents' generation and just how it's a very complex generation. I they also went through a civil war. I mean, just this, this hope of just how everything went wrong and thinking of my generation and think there's still a lot wrong with the country. However, there are people in my generation who are trying to move things forward and also this feels like the first generation even like say for instance a lot of people are going back home to be there to fix things to do stuff and so I was thinking of this series as a very hopeful series like if my parents generation the beautiful ones did not come hopefully like maybe my generation the beautiful ones are here fingers crossed. Interdeca I have to tell you thinking about this upcoming exhibition made me go back to Arma's book And I'd read that book, but I'd read it, you know, under the kind of canon of African literature. So it's, you know, Soyinka, it's Achebe. Mm -hmm. And then this time though, in thinking about the book, I realized I knew a little bit more about Ama 20 years later reading it. And, you know, he's writing the book in 68 about the events of 65, which will precede the 66 February coup Mm -hmm. in Ghana, which will oust Nkrumah. And you're right, it is, it's quite sad in ways and it feels, you know, desperate at times. And his protagonist sees that sign on the bus, that painting mm-hmm. on the bus, is like a beacon towards something better. But then when I learned a little about Arma, that, you know, at the moment at which he's writing it, he's actually writing that book outside the country. So in a sense, having it published in 68, when all of these things are happening on the world stage in terms of revolution and revolt and unrest and the response- The Biafran War in Nigeria. Exactly. The Biafran War, civil rights movement in the States, Prague Spring in Europe, you know, all of these things are happening at that moment. I'm thinking he's writing a book about the challenge of revolution at the moment of revolution. It strangely, I switched to thinking, It might not be hopeful, but it wasn't hopeless. It felt a bit more like it was a lesson. 
Yeah. Take this and learn from it and figure out how to do better. So, you know, make space for the beautiful ones to be born. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Or to thrive if they exist. Yeah. It was nice then to see that kind of hopefulness in your paintings. Nice, thanks. Yeah, yeah but they, they feel very hopeful to me when I do them. Do you think that you will always focus on young people, on children then? Will the beautiful ones ever become adults? Ooh, I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> I mean, it's one of those I can't say yes or no right now. Okay. But as the series exists in my mind, well, it's one of those like artists where we always have weird restrictions we put on ourselves in our studios. But there's a size restriction for me for the beautiful one. Okay. So number nine was the first one to break out of the size restriction. It ended up being a square and all of them are the same size rectangle. And number 10 ended up being a square, but if you actually line them all up, the children exist in the same size. So for me, they all like exist in the same visual world. And I don't know how an adult would fit in it yet. Okay. That's right now, I don't see it, but it's not a no, it's not. Okay. That's the topic of our second conversation next year when the show opens. We'll come back to this. This would be a good time, I think, to turn to some of our questions. We have really good questions for you. Can I ask you, we have a great question from our chief conservator who wants to know, most of your pictures seem monumental. Do you also make intimate studies? I, I do, but not the way people expect. So I do have a drawing book and I do little studies on them. Most people will not understand it because they are just like shaded sticks. I do those a lot. What I do the most is when works are in progress, I take a picture of the work. Oh, I might have some in my bag. My bag is right. I'm going to slide off and come back. Well, Injadeka takes a little break from us. I'm going to answer one of the questions that has been posted to us, which is someone has asked about the author and the title of the book that she has shown images from. And if I'm not mistaken, that is the book that was published by Victoria Miro on the occasion of the Beautiful One's first exhibition. Oh, yeah. Yes, that's it. That's it. I don't know how you can find it, but hopefully it's out there somewhere. And it's just the Beautiful One's My Name. But this is like a study I'm working on right now for a piece I'm about to start. And I'm like trying to figure out the perspective and where things exist in this space. So I do things like this, but what I do the most is I take a picture of the work in progress. So for instance, I have like a line drawing of a person and then I take a picture of the, my work paper with the drawing on it, and I print out that picture, then I draw on that picture to figure things out. So it's not like archival or anything, but I will do very detailed drawings as I, for instance, the kid with the car in front, when that started, I will have a drawing of the kid, and then I'll take a picture of that drawing that's just a line drawing of the kid, and I print it out, and then I'll start drawing all the card variations I have in front of her. So I might end up with like five drawings of three different poster cards in front of her, and then I make a decision. And it's one of those things like, yes, everybody who works with me and my partner, they tell me you can do it in Photoshop, but I am analog that way. I like to do those drawings. Just like it's a thinking, meditative process as I'm drawing different cards, and I just it helps me make a decision to do it that way. So for like this work behind me is a combination of, I think I counted it and it's a combination of 11 different source images. So I had to like do little sketches for different plants in front to make a decision for which one I want. So they're not full drawings. They're usually like a printout of a work in progress with a drawing or a painting on it. So it's like um, old school Photoshop. Wow. But you know, that's what you would have done if you had been a photographer working to resize and reset images for reproduction, you know, in a print publication, for example, before Photoshop. So it makes sense that you come back to that as a process. I'm going to move and try and get my stuff. Um, But if you have other questions, I will answer it. So um, Ikim Stanley Okoye, the great art historian from the University of Delaware, asked us a really good question. And I'm going to try to paraphrase it here. 
And Jadeka, even in your resetting beautiful ones is the density of background photographs. How are we to read your use of them? A Nigerian can read them closely, but what work do you expect or want or hope your American viewer does to grasp Ooh. your hands? Oh, that's, that's a such a good question. Ooh, and I'm thinking as I walk. <laughs> So this was uh, an, not an issue, but uh, something that came up in graduate school. Just so many of the things are specific to Nigeria. And with some of the works, like if you go back to number two, please. Um, so with some of the works, the transfers are specific to the piece. So number two is my brother with the green and yellow outfits. So he had lots of outfits that look like that. Some people call them Biafran suits, which are, and sometimes the Biafran suits are short sleeve. They're like this weird mix of like safari design thing. And it was very popular for boys to wear when he was growing up. And he had them in different colors and he always was feeling himself when he wore it. And so I was looking back at her pictures and I saw this, all these images of him in his Biafran suit. And I was thinking of how certain things he wore had a military vibe to them. Mm. And I was just wondering how much of it was just the politics of life filtering down to kids' outfits. Because growing up in Nigeria, like every night on TV, there was a dictator talking about something. So it's like such a big part of our image bank is military rulers in their outfits. So I was just thinking of where this aesthetic could have come from. It could have come from that, but it was also like a big thing in music, which Michael Jackson pioneered in this military kind of outfit dressing. So I was really thinking of these two veins and also thinking of making this work where he camouflaged with the garden in the background. So for the transfers for this, I was looking for military pictures from Nigeria. So there's like Babangida, Good Luck Jonathan in his military outfit, Abacha. And then I was thinking of musicians wearing military inspired outfits. So there's Chris Okotia in his Michael yeah. Jackson military inspired outfit. Um, somewhere in there is the band wearing military looking outfits. The, and I also have pictures of plants to kind of push this camouflage element. So they're like mangoes right next to his like thigh. And so that's how, for instance, I got the pictures for this piece. And it's one of those like in grad school, I knew that a lot of people will not get it. And I think for me, oh God, there's so much I can say about this. I'm trying to figure out how to organize it. One, I figured, it's okay if everybody doesn't get it. There are a lot of cultural things I encounter in America that I don't get. And it's okay. I think it's fine to shift who is centered. And I think when I make the work, yes, there are all these references to Nigeria, but they're also just paintings where I'm talking about this a history of painting. Like with this, I'm sampling different, <laughs> you know, I'm really pulling from my training from the Pennsylvania Academy, from Swarthmore, from Yale, what that history entails, talking about painting through the years, making works that are very rendered in some areas, but also like very flat in some areas that speak to someone like Peter Halley, who was one of my teachers at grad school. And so I feel like you can still enjoy them as paintings, even if you don't get these other details. And I think what gave me the courage to work the way I do, even though there's this whole other conversation about the Nigerian part of it, like who these specific people are, what it means to see Babangida in, in a transfer, like to just see his face that is lost on people who don't share that experience. And I think what gave me the courage to do that and realize it was okay was when I was in graduate school, I took a class. Well, there were two classes I took that really changed my <laughs> practice. One was an African and Caribbean diasporic literature class. Another one was a class on African literature. And we read Chinua Achebe's Arrow of God. And what Chinua Achebe does in Arrow of God is he's telling the story, but he keeps changing the point of view. So in some chapters, the point of view is from the British person in Nigeria. And when he's talking from that point of view, it's like very stilted language. He writes it in a way that we're used to of how white colonial people wrote about Africa. 
And then in subchapters, he's writing from the point of the Igbos, the villagers. It's a very different cadence. A lot, he's writing it in English, but a lot of the English is direct translations from my local language. And it just those chapters made me feel like being home. They just felt so comforting. I loved it. But then I went to class on the day we were meant to discuss Arrow of God, and I was surprised to find that people felt kind of not alienated, but they just felt like they didn't quite have an in into parts of the story, especially when it was from the point of view of the village. And I just had that like moment of, oh my God, like Achebe is doing this phenomenal thing where he's actually shifting who is being centered. I feel so seen and centered in these chapters in a way I rarely do in literature. I know what that did for me. I know how empowering it was, how, I mean, it just took me home. And I just realized like you can speak to a dual audience within the same work. So there are things people can get about painting and the history and just they are lovely images. I spend a lot of time putting it together. And for Nigerians, there is this whole other thing. I just like, this is our story. Let's talk about all the stuff that went down in that country in the 90s. I love looking at the works with Nigerians. It's a totally different conversation and experience. I remember like looking at it, you know, like I remember this experience of looking at it with a Nigerian and they saw this thing, this image that is of a cabin biscuit. It was a packet of cabin biscuits, which for an American, if you see it, you just think, oh, that's an interesting image of somebody eating a biscuit. <laughs> but this person saw it and they just went, ah, cabin biscuit, boarding house. And you could just see them go back to this memory in their head. And that was what I had thought of when I put the cabin biscuits in there, because a lot of Nigerian kids go to boarding house. It's a very unique experience. I keep thinking somebody needs to write a story about Nigerian boarding houses and just cabin biscuits is such a signifier of that for me so it was heartening to see that he got it and like retranslated it back to his own experience so I like that it speaks to dual audiences absolutely and I would say perhaps multiple audiences because I mm -hmm. think as a black American I look at them oh, yeah. and I am heartened to see happy black children they look fulfilled and they look enriched and they do, you know, this sense that they are, you know, moving about the world with joy. Yeah. And I actually like the one of my sister in her first Holy Communion outfit because I keep thinking like that could be any black kid in a lot of Southern communities. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Your fellow painter, Eileen Hogan, asked a great question. She says, you spoke very eloquently about your process in relation to composition. Can you say something about process in relation to the application of materials? transfers, colored pencils, and acrylic? Like, how do I choose which one I do? I think she might mean, I could be wrong about this, and maybe Eileen, you want to write back to it if I'm not explaining this properly, but I think that she might mean how you actually lay the materials down. Oh, okay, okay. So, yeah, now we get into the technical weeds because yeah. there are certain things that are restricted by what materials can do. So one of the rules I have in my studio is there's nothing you can fix. I have to tell myself that a lot on days when I make a mistake and I'm just like curled up rocking myself in the studio. Oh my God, someday I'll talk about the, the screen piece behind me had like a huge disaster that happened that took about a month to fix, but it got fixed. So one of the big restrictions I have on my work is the transfers can only go on raw paper. Because, you know, the transfer is a printmaking process. I print out a work. I print out a picture. I put the picture face down on my paper. And then I use acetone to transfer it. And so it can only go on raw paper because the raw paper will absorb the pigments. So that means that I have to decide pretty early on where the transfers have to go. If I make a mistake or I change my mind, it's not impossible to fix. What I actually have to do is I have to like incise, do like a very light incision around the area. I want back to raw paper and use tape to peel it back. It's a lot of work that I don't enjoy doing. So the first thing I have to determine early on is where the transfers have to go. And because I have to determine where the transfers have to go, the drawing needs to be pretty locked down. So it'll take about a month 
and I have to kind of like with this piece to figure out like what exactly is this plant in front? What exactly is happening over here? What's this? Once I have all the drawings in place, then I figure out where the transfers go. And I put the transfers down. And then the way I work, I don't figure it all out at once. I know that will be easy to figure it all out, but I'm impatient. One, it'll take me too long to figure it all out. I'm impatient. I just like, like when I clean, I like to see things vanish. <laughs> And when I make work, it's almost like if this is what needs to be done, I like for things to start disappearing. So my mind is always just like, I want to find the one thing I'm sure of and get it done. So like with this piece, once I had all the drawing done and I figured out where the transfer was going to be, I wanted to paint the back wall. I just felt like if one thing is done, it just reduces the choices that I have to make. And I do use Photoshop. So what I would do is I'll take the picture, put it in Photoshop and try to figure out the color of the wall. And then once I figure that, I paint the wall and then it's almost like the choice is narrow. But then whatever color of this has to be is determined by the wall. So the, having the color of the wall restricts what this can be. And then I paint this and that restricts what the floor can be. So it's tricky because I have put myself in a corner a lot where I'm just like, oh God, these color choices I've made have made it almost impossible to pick a color for like the chair. But I like that challenge. How do I work myself out of a corner? Anyway, so then I, I tip up where I want the transfers to be and I put the transfers in. And then after that, it's a pretty open process. I'm like going back and forth between things. The transfers work just like raw paper. I can paint on them. I can use like, if I put certain mediums in the paint, it thins it out so it's translucent. So I can do washes on the transfers. I can do opaque paintings over the transfers. I can paint, draw over them. So, so I just kind of, use them like the raw paper, but I just want these images to come forward. What I love that the transfer does, it's easy to see it in person, but you can kind of see it right around here. If you think of the mat, the plant and the pants, I love that the transfers do this thing where they flatten because they're all connected by being the same images or the same transferred images. So it's this thing that flattens, but then based on the wash I put on it, it separates them into layers. So there's this thing that's happening where things are like blended, but then they also stand out. Um, so you're looking at a picture that goes across pants and floor and plants, but there might be like a corner where that one picture is three different things at once. So that's why I, I like that the transfers kind of help me do this weird in out optical thing. Okay, I wanted to walk you quickly. Okay. I don't know if I have all this, but so this is the picture that this started from. So, I mean, you can see that's crossed legs. It looks different, but my legs are crossed. <laughs> so I knew that I wanted me, you can see my head is just a dag ball, sitting down crossed leg behind a plant next to a plant, which actually, I'm kind of surprised how close we ended up next to another plant. And in the back, it's hard to see, but in the back, there's a pot with flowers coming out of it. There it is. Wow. So that's, this is the idea. This totally makes sense to me. I can see it clearly. Then the question becomes, what are the plants? Where do you get them from? So I had a, a photo session with my husband, I ended up including my kid. That's a whole different story, but it came out of a studio visit with someone. So the session, instead of just being me, ended up being me with my kid and with my, his nanny to distract him because I wanted him looking a particular way. And so I finally did a drawing from the picture I got. So this is what I had on the paper. So then this is what I will print out and I start drawing on this. So it's hard to see, but you can see me drawing on that. That's like me drawing in the pot. I kind of did this drawing of the hanging plant. I'm asking myself questions. I'm making notes. Like what's the image on the wall? What's on the table? And then I have plants, Madagascar jasmine, safari sunset. I'm like just thinking of the things I want. And then I actually went to um, Huntington. What's it called? The Huntington Art Museums. And yeah, but they have like gardens. Yeah, yeah, I went with my husband and a white bed sheet so we could get silhouettes of plants. 
And so you can also see me doing drawings. So I knew I wanted like a climbing vine. I was thinking of having a chair in the back that didn't happen anymore with a painting on the wall that didn't happen anymore. So it's changing. And then you can see like the drawing in front of the work. And so it's just like growing a little bit. And then I do things like this to figure out where the transfers go. So I'm constantly like going back and drawing into the things. And Tadeka, I don't know that I've ever been involved in a conversation where someone actually answered my process question. Thank you so much. This was <laughs> incredibly generous. I know I really just looking at the chat and people are texting me now. People are so excited about what you will show with us. And interestingly enough, you went to the Huntington for an inspiration for that painting. After the show closes with us next year, actually in 23, we'll open in 22, close in, in the winter of 23, it will travel to the Huntington. So yeah. the works will return there. Um, yeah, it's amazing. Oh God, I, I shouldn't admit to this then. But the Huntington was amazing. No, because we were going into, they tell you not to leave the pathway, but we had to like go into the plan bed. You're my friend. <laughs> You're a to no one in this conversation is going to say anything about that because we're so excited about what you've done. Yeah, really. no, because normally when I want plans, I'm looking online. And this is one of the things that frustrates me, especially when I know the particular plans I'm looking for, but it's just, I can't find a clean picture online. It's like, it's usually like, next to other plants so there's just green everywhere and you can differentiate the plant so finally i thought like i need clean plant silhouettes and i thought like i just want to go somewhere with plants have a white bed sheet behind the plant and take a picture so it's just a silhouette and i thought why not why not go to huntington and do it so i ended up with a whole folder of plants that i keep going back to now and it just it was amazing Wonderful. So this, this plant is, this front plant is from Huntington. There's one in the background that is from the internet and the Madagascar jasmine is from my garden. Wow. As is that one. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much for this. We've so enjoyed talking to you. I can't wait for you to come back to New Haven in person. And we look forward to the exhibition next year. I want to remind everyone that this conversation is one of a series, and that on Friday at the same time, we will pick up again with this series um, when Yinka Shonabara, CBRA, yes, in conversation with Martina Droth, the center's deputy director and chief curator, will be back to talk to us. And Jadeka, many, many thanks. Oh, I want to say thank you so much for this. Thank you for everyone still online. I want to say it's been exciting to talk about the beautiful ones and keep peeping the bag like right over your shoulder. I've, I've enjoyed seeing it. Yeah. That's um, from 1C. Exactly. That's um, your sister. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.